Praise the Lord. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. To our youths, to our fathers, to our mothers, to the young professionals, and to our little, little children, Happy New Year in Jesus' name. I pray that this year will be a good year for you. The tears of the previous years wiped away in Jesus' name. And the defeat of the previous years, the degradation of the previous years, and the sorrows of the previous years, the Lord take away from every life in Jesus' name. To our headquarters here and all the churches in our nation and the churches in our continent, Africa, and the churches beyond Africa, everywhere, and to our friends and worshipers together online, I say happy year, happy new year in Jesus' name. I pray that in all the countries and in all the nations and everywhere, everywhere we're connected together. Whether you're listening now or you're listening later, I pray that this year will be a different year in every life, a prosperous year in every life, a peaceful year in every life, and it is a year to meet up with your desires in Jesus' name. What is the person I'm praying for? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless your name. We thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you are yet do. I pray that your blessing will multiply in every life here, there, everywhere, in our congregations, in our churches, and online, everywhere, in Jesus' name. I pray that this year, nothing will stop our progress. Nothing will hinder your progress. And everything the Lord has ordained that you will have, you will have, you will do, you will be in Jesus' name. And I pray the God of the covenant, the covenant keeper, will be faithful in every prayer you pray, every move you make, everything you lay your hands upon will prosper in Jesus' name. Last year will not creep into this year. Past failures will not creep into this new life of success in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God has blessed you. You can sit down. This is a covenant month. We've been doing that now for many, many years, for some decades. And every January we come together to remind ourselves of the goodness of God, the graciousness of God, and the covenant he has made with his people. And how, even till today, the God that changes not is the God of covenant, and he blesses people according to the covenant we have with him. Today, I'm talking to you on a better covenant with better promises in Christ. A better covenant with better promises in Christ. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. But now I see obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is. He was, he is, he will ever be. He is the mediator of a better covenant which was established, planted, settled, sustained upon better promises. He gives us the better covenant. The Lord made covenant with Abraham. And when he made the covenant with Abraham, he fulfilled the terms of the covenant. And he gave the blessings of the covenant. He made covenant with 
David and he fulfilled all the blessings he said he'll give out in that covenant. He made covenant with the nation Israel and he fulfilled the covenant promises he made unto them. A better covenant now, a new covenant now, a higher covenant now, a greater covenant now and he brings in his faithfulness and he brings in his love and his power in fulfilling that better covenant. A better covenant with better promises in Christ. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, it says, for this is the covenant that I will make with them, the, with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, is the Lord that made the covenant, is the Lord that proclaimed about the covenant, is the Lord that himself originated the covenant. He said, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Better covenant that he makes with his church better covenant that he makes with his people, better covenant that he makes with everyone that will come into redemptive relationship with him. And there are benefits in that covenant. There are promises in that covenant. There's the goodness of God in that covenant. And that's why we're inviting you, everyone. If you're coming for the first time, I want to show you how you come into covenant relationship with the Lord. If you have never known the Lord as you come and you hear and you know that Christ is the mediator, the mediator of this better covenant, any other covenant you have made before, you cancel that. Any other covenant you have given yourself into, a covenant with this devil, a covenant with death, a covenant with maybe a gang, you cancel that and you come to this better covenant. When God calls something better, it's better. And when the whole of heaven, when he calls something better, it is better. No matter what agreement you have had, what covenant you have had, and what relationship you have had, and no matter uh, what kind of thing you have gotten yourself into, that you call a covenant when you come to the Lord and you have this better relationship something better must happen in your life. And then if you have been a child of God, you have been in a covenant relationship with God, but you need to know what is the benefit of that to me. What am I getting out of that? As we go through today and every Sunday until even the final Sunday, which will be at the GCK, at the Gospel Proclamation, the Crusade Worldwide, we're still going to be pursuing that covenant every Sunday. And things must change in your life, in your family, in the work of your hand, in your profession, everywhere you go to today, angels will say, look at a, a, a covenant son. Look at a covenant, a covenant daughter. And everyone will rejoice that now you come into an unbreakable covenant with God with better promises and better provision in your life in Jesus' name. Uh, let's look at three things here. Number one, number one is the basic privilege in the new covenant. A new covenant, a better covenant. What are the basic privileges we have in that new covenant? Number two, the better promises in the better covenant. Uh, the covenant is not just uh, uh, something superficial, something plastic something ordinary is extraordinary and you're coming into this special better covenant with the lord better promises great promises will be fulfilled in your life in jesus name and now number three is the believer's position what am i 
What's my position? What's my portion? What do I have as I come into this everlasting covenant with God? The believer's portion and the believer's position in the everlasting covenant. We're coming to number one now. Number one, we're coming to the basic privileges in the new covenant. The basic privileges in the new covenant covenant we're coming to um, chapter 8 of hebrews hebrews chapter 8 we're reading from verse 8 for finding fault with them says he he says behold the days come says the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of Judah. And then in verse 10, in verse 10 he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I, the Almighty God, I, the covenanter, I, the covenant maker, he says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people I want to see and um, come back to verse 9 of that uh, chapter 8 in verse 9 not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, says the Lord. Why was well, the first covenant cancelled, removed, taken out of the way? Because they, re they didn't continue in his covenant we have a part to play he makes the covenant and we come into covenant relationship with him he keeps his part he's a faithful god and we have to keep our part because that is the condition how the privileges of the covenant will come upon our lives he said because they didn't continue in the covenant he regarded them not were to continue in the conditions of the covenant it's not just to have a covenant sunday service it's not just to hear the word covenant all through the year he wants us day by day in our families in our personal lives in our private lives in the offices everywhere we go he wants us to continue in the conditions that is spelled out in the terms of the covenant. That is the only way he also will regard us and he will fulfill the covenant in our life. He will in Jesus' name. And we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 31. And in verse 31, Jeremiah chapter 31, we're reading from verse 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Even far back at the time of Jeremiah, when he was still living under the conditions of the old covenant, he looked at them, they were not as faithful as Enoch. He looked at them, they were not as faithful as Abraham. He looked at them, they were not as faithful as Joshua and the leaders that followed after Joshua. He looked at them, they were not so committed to the covenant of the Lord as Samuel was and as Jeremiah was, as Isaiah was because of that. I'm going to push this old covenant aside. And then he said, Behold, the days come. The days are coming. Now the days have come. I said, The days have now come. Christ has come. 
And because of Christ, a new covenant has been put in place. And the new covenant that is established by Christ upon better promises is now in effect. And what God said, the days were coming, the, day, the days have not come that I will make. I will make. It originates from him. And he tells us the condition of that covenant. I will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah a new covenant. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, it tells us, but this is, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. It tells us, even before this time, he had told the people, he said, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. Why? Because when they have the law inside their heart, they'll have his love in their heart. They'll have his life in their heart. And they will have all the abundance that he had promised them. They'll have that in their heart. Because they could, they didn't live the life. They didn't have the love to love the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, and all their mind. Because the law was not in their heart. The law was in a stone. And they forgot the law of God. Forgetting the law of God. They forgot God. Forgetting God. They forgot his love. They forgot his life. And they forgot his provision. God said, here is the solution now. I'm going to make this new covenant for them. And I'll put my law in their mind and I'll write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. God said that's the only way. When the law of God is in their heart, they remember me every time. They love me every time. They live the life I, I want them to live every time and because of that, all the promises that he has promised, because of the law, the love and the life, all the promises will now be fulfilled in them. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 32, reading from verse 38, Jeremiah chapter 32, reading from verse 38, and it shall be my people, it shall be my people, I'll care for them like my people, I'll provide for them like my people, I'll protect them like my people, I will gird them and guide them like my people, my face will shine upon them and my glory will be upon them like my people. There are only two kinds of people in the world, only two kinds of people in the world. Number one, his people. Number two, those who are not his people. And you cannot stay in the middle, neither for God nor for the world, neither for God nor for the devil, neither for God nor for, nor for the nor for the world. You have to be either here or there. And he said, I'll separate them. I'll take them out. I'll make them different. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And see, there are only two kinds of people in the world that will live now. My people, I'll be caring for them. They'll be like the children of Israel when everything was right with them and they were in the land of Goshen. And then the other people who are not in the land of Goshen, they were outside the land of Goshen but in the same Egypt, they said, these are my people, and this is what I'll do for them. These are not my people. Well, when they come back to me, then they'll have the benefit of my people. He said, when they become my people in this covenant, who are the people of God in this covenant? The people who turn away from their sins. The people who repent, the people who give everything you know, unto the Lord, their heart, their soul, their mind, and then in obedience to God every time, they show, number one, by experience, they show, number two, by their lifestyle, they belong to God. And God also recognizes them and he says, I will be their God. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, it says, and I will give them one heart. I will give them, even if they're up to a million or three million or ten million or one hundred million, all of them, I'll give them the same kind of heart. 
What kind of heart is that? The heart that is yielded to God, the heart that is yielded to the word of God, the heart that is willing and obedient to obey the Lord, all of them, all of them in the new covenant, that's the same heart I will give unto them. And I will give them one heart and one way. One way, that is, all the people that come into this new covenant, they'll follow one way, the narrow way that leads to heaven. None of them will be in the broad way of sinfulness, in the broad way of depravity, in the broad way of license, doing whatever they wanted. But God said, I'll give them one heart, I'll give them one way. And it says, and they shall shall fear me forever. They shall fear me forever. If you remove one day, it's no more forever. If you remove one night, it's no more forever. If you remove one month, it's no more forever. If you remove six days, and then you only come to church, and you fear God, and you remember God, only one day, Sunday, it's no more forever. It says every time, every moment of your life, when you come to know the Lord, and you become His people, and He becomes your God, and he cuts the new covenant with you. He says, this is what he will do. He will make you from the depth of your heart because the law is reaching in your heart. He says, he'll make you to fear him forever for the good of them. As long as you fear the Lord, as long as you obey the Lord, as long as you love the Lord, it's for your good. The goodness of the Lord will be there every time and the goodness of blessing will be there every time. He load you with blessing every day because you love the Lord you fear the Lord, you obey the Lord forever no day missing when you don't fear the Lord and it says and of their children after them in verse 40 it tells us in verse 40 and I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Actually, when you come into the new covenant and you abide by the condition of the new covenant, you're not uh, in and out, in and out, standing and falling, prodigal and proper. No, you remain a real child of God, obedient to the Lord every time that you will not turn away or depart from him. Your experience of the Christian faith, your experience of Christ remains stable every time the life you live shows that the law of God is reaching in your heart. It shows that you're obedient to the Lord every time. And that is what he does by the experience we have. We have salvation. We have sanctification. And our heart has become renewed, has become totally changed. And because we live intimate with him all the time, his blessing is also upon us every time. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 5. They shall ask the way to Zion. With their faces, see the word, saying, come. Let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. The people who come into covenant relationship with the Lord, they are also telling other people, and they say, come come to the Lord and let us all join together having a perpetual covenant with the Lord. But you know, there are people who say the children of God, they're saved and they never talk to any other person about coming out of the world and coming in into the kingdom of God. The desire is not in them. The passion is not in them. And the, and the willingness, the conviction is not in them. When you're a real child of God, 
You came out of darkness to light. You came out of your sin, out of your sinfulness, and you came to the Savior. You came out of self, and you are now sanctified in the Lord, the same passion in you. You want to be in them, and the same conversion you have, you want others to have the conversion to you, and you are telling everybody, everybody in your office, everybody in the farm, everybody in the community, everybody among your acquaintances, if anybody, all the contacts on your phone everywhere you're saying come 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 let us join ourselves not to the church no you join yourself to the lord first you join yourself to christ first if salvation becomes a reality in your life only then after they are they are really in the lord do they come to the church if they come to the church uh, without coming to christ that doesn't give them uh, the relationship and the inheritance with the lord and with the covenant but you are telling them let us join ourselves to the lord in a perpetual covenant a covenant that as the person is coming now he knows he's not going back to darkness again it's not going back to sin again it's not going back to the gang again it's not going back to all those evil things that he had been doing before because this is a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten i pray that all these benefits the life the law the love and the loyalty everything will be stamped upon our hearts in jesus name in ezekiel chapter 37 in ezekiel chapter 37 reading from verse 25 it tells us in verse 25 of ezekiel chapter 37 uh, chapter 37 reading from verse 26 it says in verse 26 it says moreover i will make a covenant of peace for them i'll not they'll not be fighting against me what to them that fight against their maker and i will not be fighting against them will be at peace together you're reconciled with god your mind reconciled with God. Your heart recon reconciled with God. Your happiness, everything about you reconciled with God. It says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We're no more fighting God. We're no more fighting the law of God. We're no more fighting the demand of God. When you are really a child of God and you have this covenant with God, the basic provision of that is that you have a covenant of peace with him it shall be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. You can see what the Lord is uh, driving at that when this new covenant, when it comes, it will not be that you are in and out, in and out, falling and rising uh, but that you will remain with the Lord and the covenant that he makes will be in you and in your life and it will be a, a covenant forevermore. Now in Luke, we're looking uh, sorry, chapter 36 now of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36, we're reading from verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon them, and they and ye shall be clean, uh, clean cleanness or cleanliness in the heart, in your life, in your character, every hypocrisy, it wipes away. Every kind of pretense, it wipes away. Every kind of uh, deception, it wipes all that away. Every kind of defilement, defilement in your character, defilement in your language, Re defilement in your lifestyle, defilement in the secret, defilement in the public. Anything that defiles your soul or transfers defilement to another person, it washes that away. That 
is the basic benefit we have, the basic privilege we have in the new covenant. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon them, and they shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, anything you idolize, anything you lift up above God, above the watch of God, and you cannot deal without that, you say, God, I'll have that. If you are going to make me your child, I remain your child with the permission that I love this above you, then I'll, I'll go on. But if not, if you don't allow me to have my way to love this, whatever it is, money, whatever it is, job, whatever it is, overseas education, whatever it is, all those uh, things that people do, maybe a woman, maybe a man, whatever it is, if you allow me to love this above you, I'll carry on with you. If not, then I cannot. And God says, I cannot have that. I will not share my glory with any man, with any woman, or with any substance, but if you come into the new covenant, I will cleanse you. And from all your filthiness, and from your, all your idols, I will cleanse you. And then in verse 26, it tells us in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. What's this saying? It's saying the hardened heart of Pharaoh does not go along with the covenant. And the stony heart of Nebuchadnezzar does not go along with the new covenant. And the stubborn will of Esau does not go along with the covenant. If we're in the covenant, the stony heart is taken away. The hard heart is taken away. The stubbornness is taken away. If we are in the covenant with him, in reality, that God himself understands, recognizes, and that he confirms that covenant with him will take away the stony heart of Pharaoh and the hardened heart of Nebuchadnezzar and the foolish heart of Herod. He takes that away. Being in covenant with the Lord, the privilege we have is that he removes the stony heart, he removes the stubborn heart, he removes the self-willed heart, and he gives us the very heart of Christ. And then he says, I will give you an heart of flesh. In verse 27, in verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Will become a yielded man, a yielded woman, a controlled man, a controlled woman, a self-disciplined man, a self-disciplined woman. When we come into contact of the Lord and then he cuts this new covenant with us, we don't go away anymore. We don't do the things that please us anymore. We do the things that please the Lord. I will put my spirit within you to guide you, to control you, and to help you live the line of righteousness. And then it says, I'll cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments, my commandments, and do them. Luke chapter 1. We're reading from verse 72. In Luke chapter 1, verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The new covenant is a holy covenant. Obviously, you understand if it's a holy covenant, an unholy character cannot be partakers of the holy covenant. When we come into covenant with the Lord, it's a holy God. We have holy character. It's a holy covenant he makes with us. The covenant of the Lord does not make us more sinful, more disobedient, 
more evil, more fleshly, more worldly. The covenant of the Lord, a holy covenant, makes us holy. Because those are the people that can walk with the Lord. In verse 73, it says in verse 73, the host which is swear to our father Abraham. In verse 74, that he would grant unto us that we be delivered out of the hands of our enemies. Say amen before I explain. It will deliver you from all your enemies. But you know, somebody said by observation that we are our worst enemies. The goodness of the Lord before us. But inside us, we go the wrong way. And God then says, okay, if that's the way he wants to go, she wants to go, let me wait and see. And let me see what she's going to get and what he's going to get following his own way, her own way. We are our worst enemies. We eat things we shouldn't be eating. We are our worst enemies. We drink what we shouldn't be drinking. Huh? Our worst enemies. And we take things that destroy our health. Other people are smoking it, and so you smoke it, you're killing yourself. Other people are getting angry, and they're fighting, and they're violent, and you're getting angry. And when you get angry like that, anybody who knows a little bit of how the body works, the body works, they'll tell you the chemicals that, uh, you know, try, they, they begin to be activated when that anger comes, and then it heats up your brain, and sometimes you even do something physical, that will make you lose your liberty on earth because and when we are our worst enemies nobody can destroy you if you are not destroying yourself and God said I will deliver you out of the hand of your enemies all the other enemies they will not be able to overcome you when you are delivered from that enemy within let me illustrate you see Pharaoh and you see the Egyptians, they were enemies to the children of Israel. And God dealt with that. But the Israelites themselves, they were their own worst enemies. They murmured, they grumbled, they complained, they spoke against God. And they said, well, even this land flowing with me, honey, what do I want to do with that? And God said, that's all right. You don't want to get good there. And they died in the wilderness. Pharaoh could not kill them. And the Egyptians could not kill them. They were enemies, but they were delivered out of the hands of the enemies. But they were the people with their own mouths, with their own character, with their own disobedience. Look at Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They were the people that destroyed themselves. And so the Lord is telling us, when you come into this covenant relationship with the Lord, the worst enemy, your character, your behavior, your life, that cancels all the goodness of God in your life, the Lord will deliver you from the worst enemy. And then from all the enemies around, whoever they are, whatever they are, the Lord has delivered you already. And he says that he will grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemy, and serve him without fear. Are you hear that? Amen. Yeah. Serve him without fear. The best thing is for you to be totally free of fear. Because then all the talent in you will come out and come forth. The best thing is for you to be totally free from any fear. Fear of the past and fear of the present and fear of the future. When you are free from fear, you are able to think aright. You are able to talk aright. You are able to plan aright. And you are able to go the direction you ought to go. But when you are afraid, you are tied by your fear. You are hindered by your fear and you are destroyed by your fear but it is when God has delivered you from all fear you will live a life you have never lived before in Jesus name what makes somebody to run out of school fear 
What makes somebody to say, I can't do that, I can't read that, I can't perform that? Fear. What makes a person to be afraid? He cannot talk to a, you know, a man, a woman, and uh, the Lord has shown him that uh, this will be your wife, your future wife. What makes the man not to be able to talk fear? I don't know what she will say. I don't know what, what the marriage committee will say. I don't know what this will be or what that will be. Fear. What makes a person to remain under oppression? Now you are married. And then well, something you don't like what is going on, but you cannot talk. And there's an internal problem. You can't talk to your pastor. You can't talk to the group pastor. You can't talk to the overseer. You can't talk to anybody. And you're inside there, bottled up, and you're suffering. What makes a person to be like that? And is dying in silence. Fear. What makes a person not to seek for help? That, you know, here is the problem you have, and you have people that can help. They are experts on this field, on that field. What makes a person not to be able to open his mouth and ask? Fear. And all this fear that has hindered you in the past, all the fear that has muscled your mouth and grounded you in the past, this year, that fear is gone. Because it says that he would grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hand of our enemies. All the enemies might serve him without, tell me, tell me. <laughs> you know, here you are and you pray in the church and say, now I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to do good. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And now you are out after the service. You are in the bus, in the taxi, or whatever transportation. And uh, the Lord reminds you, you remember what you said? That you are going to do this and do that. Now rise up and do it. And everything you have said in the covenant service, everything you have said, talking to the Lord, saying, Lord, this is what I'll do. Get up and the people are here now. Stand up and talk to them. Fear. You can't not because of the fear. Then you get back home, you need, you're praying, oh God, forgive me. I said I will, but, but fear just gripped me that I could not. All that fear that makes us not to do what we are promised to do. And not to do what we are assigned to do. Every form of fear, the Lord will take it out of our lives in Jesus' name. And then in verse 75, in verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him, before him, you are conscious when you are in the new covenant relationship with the Lord, you are conscious every time I am before him. It's like you see the invisible and what the Lord expects that you serve him in holiness and righteousness before him. That's what you do. The grace will be there. The willingness will be there. The power will be there in holiness and righteousness before him. How many days? Tell me out aloud. All the Days of our life. We're looking at Acts chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 25. Acts chapter 3 verse 25, it says we are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. We are the children, we are the offspring of those prophets, of those fathers, of those forerunners, that the covenant which God made with them saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. By thy seed, in thy seed, shall all the kindred, the kindreds of the earth be saved. In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be delivered. In thy days shall all the kindreds of the earth be delivered and saved and transformed and their lives will be different. Look at verse 26. It says in verse 26, unto you first, God having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away everyone. That's the covenant that the basic provision 
and privilege of the covenant that he, Christ, has come and is the mediator of the new covenant, of the better covenant. And he blesses us by turning us away, everyone, from his iniquities. I pray that will happen in your life. Not just bread and butter. Yes, provision of bread and butter. Not just happiness. Yes, provision of happiness. Not just health. Wonderful. Health available. But the first basic heaven sage benefit, privilege of the covenant is that he turns us away from our iniquities. So what does that mean? Turning away everyone from his iniquities. He turns your mind away. You don't even love that thing anymore. And you don't welcome that thing anymore. And you don't appreciate or you don't really love or delight in that thing anymore. Because now Christ, by his saving grace, Christ, by the provision of the new covenant, has turned your mind away from that. And your friend might offer you and say, hi about this. I'm not really interested in that anymore. What do you mean? You see, you craved for this, and this was your life. You say, I'm not interested anymore because the Lord has turned away your heart from your iniquity. Sometimes it's something you have even paid a lot of money for, and it is something you have almost, uh, almost sacrificed your life for. And now you see it is iniquity, and you see it is turning your mind, your heart away from heaven. And now you come to the Lord, and you have this basic benefit and basic privilege of the new covenant. And uh, somebody said, come, come, come. I see an open door. We can have that thing. You say, what? Then he mentions it. My mind is not there anymore. I don't want that anymore. Why? Because you become a child of the covenant. And because you have that covenant with the Lord now, every evil sin, every defilement, every decision you made before, everything you craved before, all that is now gone. That is the provision and that is the benefit of the covenant. I pray the Lord will effect it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two, the better promises in the better covenant. The better promises in the better covenant. We're looking at Hebrews again, chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 6. Chapter 6, we're looking at uh, verse 6. It says, but now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, a more excellent ministry, Moses had a ministry, but the ministry of Christ is more excellent. Joshua had a ministry, but the ministry of Christ is more excellent. And all those prophets in the Old Testament, they had a ministry. But the ministry of Christ is more excellent. It changes hearts. It transforms hearts. It does what those ministers in their ministries could not do. Because now Christ has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Think about that. All that Aaron did as a high priest, all that other high priests of the old covenant, all that he did, Christ now is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. What are those promises? Better promises. If you just, you know, maybe you just read the word of God and you are moving around the perimeter of the real thing and you are hovering over the real thing. You are superficial. The Lord has given us definite promises and there are better promises that you could ever think of in the old covenant. Look at Titus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. In Titus chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 2. It says, in hope of eternal life, 
which God that cannot lie has promised before the world began. What life do we have? Human life, natural life, animal life, ordinary life, sinful life. But now, in this new covenant, the promise that he has given us and the promise he has made to us is the promise of eternal life. He gives us eternal life and this is the God who cannot lie. If you don't have that new life, that converted life, that change of life, that transformed life, what kind of life do you have from the new covenant, from the better covenant? We must pray to the Lord and must know what we are asking the Lord. If you have food, that's not eternal life. If you have all that food and water and the natural things can give you, that's not eternal life. If you have only education, even those people outside there, they have that education. If you have job, those people outside, they have jobs. If you have position in the world, those people outside there, they have that. If you're going to show that you have, the promise, the better promises, better than what they have outside, the first thing is that you must have this eternal life that gives you hope hoping God and it is God who cannot lie who has promised us this he'll give it to everyone look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says but as in due times manifested his word through the preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Let's look at First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. The prophets of the Old Testament, when they prophesied about the coming covenant, about the new covenant, about what Christ will do when he comes, they were searching and they were inquiring what kind of promise is this they were writing about. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will that should follow verse 12 it says in verse 12 unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us better promise that the salvation they were promising the salvation they were revealing those prophets those people of the old covenant that it was not for them but for us and it says the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The salvation, the salvation that is so real, the basic fulfillment and the better fulfillment of the promise of God that what the Old Testament people, Old Covenant people did not have, now we can have. You can have better salvation. Or oh, you think about that, look at all those prophets of the Old Testament and look at the things they prophesied and look at even their shining lives and those people that spoke, they spoke by the Holy Ghost within them and yet the salvation they had is not like, not so good, not as firm, not as clear, not as pure as our salvation. It says, to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel, the good news unto you, which with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels even desire to look 
into. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, having therefore these promises, that they beloved, that they beloved, saved, that they beloved, they're justified. Dearly beloved, they're in the kingdom of God. And he says, dearly beloved, look at the promises we have. Having therefore these promises, plural, promise of salvation, promise of a changed heart, the promise of a new heart, the promise of getting rid of the stony heart, the stubborn heart, the promise of having the very nature of Christ in us. It says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. That's the better promise we have, that now we're cleansed, we're saved, now we can be sanctified, and the nature of Christ can be implanted in us. It says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. Perfecting holiness. Do you understand that? We have the holiness, but the holiness is having some, you know, dust on it. Perfect it. Wipe up the dust. And the holiness you have, there are some character, there are some habits, there are some things that makes people to doubt. And they say, is this holiness? Is, all, is this all they can do? This holiness is not better than the holiness of the Old Testament people. Look at the holiness he has promised to us in the new covenant. A shining holiness, a bright holiness, an uncompromising holiness. And holiness that is there through and through and holiness that you don't have to open your eyes wide and be searching you just see the holiness right there it says let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God that the new covenant and that is what the Lord has provided if you tell me I'm in the new covenant but there's no fear of God in your heart. There's no fear or regard for God. That like God sees everything, knows everything, and God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And you say you are saved and a new covenant. I say, read this again. He wants you to be cleansing yourself every time and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God. And now in Luke chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 46, saved salvation, that's the promise, and then sanctified, perfecting holiness, that's the promise, and now he tells us there's something that follows peace and purity and the power of God. It says in Luke chapter 24, verse 46, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Then in verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You have repented? Preach that to other people too. And you have, um, you've cleaned up your past, you've made restitution. Preach that to others too. Don't cover it up, repentance, restitution. Don't cover it up, repentance and making your life right. Don't cover it up. And now, are you more righteous now than you were when you were born again? When you were born again, it was your passion to correct everything. You remember that you apologize. You remember that you paid back your debt. You remember that you made right everything. You remember that the polygamy, you corrected everything and that other extra woman left. You remember that and that illicit relationship you had with that man, with that woman. You got rid of that. Good old days. Your righteousness should be higher now. Your faithfulness should be higher now. Your restitution. At that time you knew. Now if I open my mouth and I confess that I'll be in trouble, I might lose uh, this, lose that. But you went ahead anyway. And you did what the Lord wanted us to do. 
because you had real salvation 20 years after, 30 years after, 40 years after, you cannot stand on that same repentance and restitution of righteousness. Where is the better covenant then? The Lord wants us to have such a heart that I want to be right with God. Whatever he thinks of me, whatever she thinks of me, it doesn't matter. I am going to stay and stand with that repentance, with restitution, with righteousness, and I want to make right whatever is wrong. Look at verse 49. In verse 49, it now tells us, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high tarry in the city of Jerusalem. That means in your own local church. That means here at the headquarters church. That means anywhere we are tarry there. And not be too much, don't be too much in a hurry. You know, if you're too much in a hurry, run through the message very quickly. We're talking to an international body. International body will not have salvation, sanctification, only goes baptism, power from on high. Run through, run through. No, we're not going to run through. And then, after the message, after we have preached, there's no time to for prayer. We're running for the bus. We're running back home. What are you running home for? What you have got? Are you satisfied? And he says we should tarry. Why do we say we're children of God and we're not obeying the Lord and we're interested in other things on Sunday like this and we're not interested in tarrying before the Lord? The Lord said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, we're reading from verse 4. In verse 4, look at what he tells us, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Are we obeying the commandments of the Lord today? That when we have heard the word of God, don't rush out, don't run away, tarry and wait. It says he commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. Anybody waiting today? But wait. Are we waiting in prayer today? But wait. Are we not in a hurry today? But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence it will happen power will come again. The church at large, even Pentecostal churches, they do not have the power today. They do not have the vision today. They do not have the passion of the Lord today. They do not have the strength of the Spirit today. They do not have the faith, the heightened faith they ought to have because all the churches everywhere, even ours included, hurry, hurry, hurry. You cannot pray. You pray for five minutes, a bed is ringing somewhere. You pray for ten minutes, something is, uh, you know, disturbing somebody somewhere because we ourselves, when I hurry, and there are people behind the curtain, behind the scene, uh, they're also in a hurry, and they want to hurry us up. They determine how long we hear the word of God. They determine how long we stay in the presence of the Lord. They determine how we're serious and committed to the Lord. And they monitor us, they moderate us, they control us, they hinder us, they check us. In the old year, that's why we missed a lot of what we should have got. In this new year, we will be different. I will be different. We'll see that difference from today in Jesus' name. It says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days. Let's look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive power. 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He was talking to all the believers. It's not only that the pastor will receive power. It's not only that the preachers will receive power. It's not only that our overseers will receive power. Everyone, everyone, he saved us. He sanctified us. He wants to baptize us in the Holy Ghost. It says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We are far away from Jerusalem and you are far away. Well, those people listening online, you are far away from Jerusalem. A few people in Jerusalem and it says all of us to the uttermost part of the earth. He wants us to wait until the uttermost part of the earth. He wants us to receive the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Where we you? This year will be the year of a new kind of revival of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 33. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, being by the right hand of God exalted, he's talking about Christ. He died for our sins, was buried. He rose again for our justification. And after appearing to his disciples by many infallible proofs that he's risen, now he went to heaven and is now seated on the right hand of God on high. And he says, being by the right hand of God exalted and have received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He has received it for you. He has received it to give unto you. Have you received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost? He has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Then in verse 38, we're told in verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, water baptism, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, forgiveness, and cleansing of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Check up your life. Do you have the gift they add? The gift of the Holy Ghost, the power they add, the power of the Holy Ghost, the anointing they add, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That's the better thing. All the other things we have been getting, healing, they got that in the Old Testament. Deliverance, they got that in the Old Testament. But the new covenant, the better covenant, the shining life of the sage and the consistent life of those who are born again and the purity and the holiness and the sanctification that the Old Testament people, many of them did not have and the power of the Holy Ghost that many of those people in the Old Testament did not have because Christ was not yet glorified but now he's at the right hand of the Father and he says he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and then in verse 39 he tells us for the promise is unto you. It's the promise in the new covenant. It's the promise in the better covenant. It's the promise of immersion, being enveloped and being endued with the power from on high. The power of the Holy Ghost. It says the promise is unto you and to your children to your converts, to the people that follow. And then it says, and to all that are far off. We are the people afar off, Gentiles, and yet the promise of salvation for us and the promise of sanctification for us and the promise of the power of the Holy Ghost for us, it says the people that are afar off, the promise of total freedom from all the power, all the darkness of the world, the promise that the Lord himself has made. And I want to ask you again, since you came to the Lord, have you got that kind of purity, perfect purity? 
perfection have you gotten that have you got that kind of holiness perfect holiness have you got that kind of consistent life that never yields to any temptation have you been totally free from your old life from your old habits if we have not got that why when the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off do we have the stability today do we have the steadfastness today and there are people we look at our children and you tell me when you when you're able to see me look at my boy look at my daughter she was fervent he was fervent he used to lead the prayer at the family altar and when he takes that bible when he was with us he'll share the word with him you know students like himself but pastor my child went to school and i sent him to higher institution and now when he came back i'm surprised of what i see of my child he doesn't Relish, desire the Bible anymore. The word is no more in him. Even to join us in the family devotion, he can hardly do that. And when he does, the fire he had before he went to university, he doesn't have that fire now. Pastor, help me. Before our child went off to school, she, he appeal righteous holy and he will not touch anything that is evil now he's come back and when we checked up his uh, box or whatever we saw these uh, things that they drink and smoke that turns their head pastor help us but look at the promise he has given us that the promise is unto you and to your children our students our, our converts all the people where are they at today where are they where is the life of the new covenant in the lives today? Come to our own workers and come to our own members. What's the life of the members today? The members of our church that could kneel down there and pray 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour, and somebody else will remind them, look at the time. And then they go, when they come back again and they put down all the office materials and kneel down that they pray. And then in the night, they wake up at night and they pray. Where is that today? That's what we're saying. And this is the benefit of the new covenant that the Lord himself has provided for us. That that, that life of peace, that life of purity, that life of power will come back again to you in Jesus' name. It says to them, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. We're looking at Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, we're looking at verse 16. Romans chapter 4, we're looking at verse 16. In verse 16, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. It is by faith so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. The seed of Abraham and the seed those who have come to know the Lord that the promise might be sure in our lives. And then it says not to that only which is of the Lord but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham who is the father of all so look at verse 20 there in verse 20 it says and he staggered not at the promise of god through unbelief whatever promise of god has made of oh, peace peace forevermore peace in the heart peace in your language peace in your life peace in your family peace all around perfect peace there's some people that stagger at that how can that be whatever promise god has made that will make us holy it'll make us righteous all the days of our lives before god that's what, how can that be how can somebody live one whole week and he remains holy night and day inside and outside private and public how can he remain holy with interaction with this and that if the world all around how can that be they stagger at the promise of god and then with the power of the holy ghost in our lives they say how can that be somebody not to have any fear at all 
Somebody not to have any weakness at all. Somebody not to have any cowardice at all. Somebody to stand straight and stand firm. Even in persecution to stand. How can that be? That's what the Lord has promised. But he staggered at the promise of God through unbelief. It said he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strong in faith giving glory to God in verse 21 it says in verse 21 he's telling us the attitude of Abraham, he's telling us the faith of Abraham, he's telling us of the steadfastness of Abraham and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform this year will be a year of performance in your life in Jesus name performance in my life demonstration in my life the goodness of God in your life in my life in Jesus name point number three now is the believers portion in the everlasting covenant the believers portion portion what portion do we have in the everlasting covenant we're looking at psalm 73 and verse 24 psalm 73 verse 24 thou shalt guide me with thy counsel that the benefit we have that the provision we have that the promise we have and that's the portion we have in the new covenant thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory verse 25 in verse 25 whom have I in heaven but thee the heart that leaps up Christ exalts the Lord and the only thing, the only one he has is the God of heaven and the Christ in heaven. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth that I desire beside thee. What an experience that you are so saved, you are so sanctified that the only one important for you the only one indispensable in your life here on earth and there in glory is the Lord in heaven. There is none and there is nothing upon the earth that I desire besides thee. Can you say that? If success is your number one thing. After that, if you have success, okay, I'll serve the Lord now. Can you say that? If wife is your number one thing i'm looking for wife they're talking about holiness i'm looking for wife i'm looking for husband and they're talking about righteousness can you say that if wife husband is the number one thing in your life i'm looking for children and they're talking about you know consecration devotion absolute surrender can you say this if had wanting children wanting job wanting money wanting house wanting land wanting car wanting property is the number one in your life if your Christianity if your profession has turned to okay I'm serving God I should have this I'm serving God I should have that look at that verse 25 whom have I in heaven but thee and there is none and there is nothing upon earth that I desire beside thee look at verse 26 it says in verse 26 it tells us here my flesh and my heart faileth, fainting panting for you but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever God is the strength of my life and he is my portion forever. God first, I want him. I want his love. I want his provision. I want everything belonging to the Lord. I want to give my heart, my will, my mind, everything I have unto the Lord. It's the joy of my life. It's the happiness of my life. It's the only one I desire that I want. He says, God is the strength of my heart and is my portion forever. We're looking at uh, chapter 8 of Romans. Romans chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 32. In Romans chapter 8 verse 32, he that spared not his own son 
but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things christ the savior my portion christ the sanctifier my portion christ the lord my portion, my controller, Christ, they're all in all in my life. Before asking for clothes, asking for money, asking for job, asking for wife, asking for husband, asking for children, asking for this, asking for that, Christ. He did not spare his life, and the Father did not spare his Son. He gave him to me as Savior. He must be the most precious portion that I have. And then after that, he delivered, he was delivered up for us all so that he can save us. Number one, he can purify or sanctify us. Number two, it can empower us, envelop us with his power, baptize us in the Holy Ghost. Number three, and then how shall he not now freely with him give us all things? Look at verse 35. In verse 35, it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know, the people who are bread and butter Christians, and all they are asking is, so oh God, I don't worry about heaven. I don't even think about that, but I need this material thing. I need this mundane thing. If there's any persecution, they are gone. If there's any misunderstanding, they're gone. If there's any control on them, don't go that way. Don't go that go this way. They are gone. They say, no, I don't. All I want is I want blessing and I want to keep my old heart. But look at this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Look at verse 36. It says in verse 36, as it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for slaughter. Verse 37, Nay, in all these things, in all the persecution, there are some preachers that cannot continue pastoring or preaching if there's a little criticism, if there's a little pressure, if there's a little persecution, if there's a little misunderstanding, a little criticism, a little pain in their body. They say, I can't preach today. We we'll say, why? Say, look at my problem. What problem do you have beyond the crown of songs, song cries? He says, Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then he says in verse 38, he says, verse 38, for I am persuaded, a saved soul, persuaded, a sanctified soul, persuaded. A baptized in the Holy Ghost person persuaded, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, whatever is present in our community now, nor things to come. Verse 39, it says, no height, no depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. Jesus our Lord. I pray that will be your own confession to in Jesus' name. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 3. It says in verse 3, according as his divine power has given unto us all things. That's our portion, the portion we have in the Lord. It says according as his divine power power he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue and then in verse 4 it tells us in verse 4 whereby are given unto us 
this is a portion exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature partakers of the divine nature that's the portion we have and this is more than this is greater this is better than all those little little substance and material things it says he gives us the nature the nature of God the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is the world through loss. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, this is what you'll be seeking after, running after, and this is what you'll be pursuing, this is what you'll be praying for. Add to your faith virtue. That's a great portion. And to virtue, knowledge. That's a great portion. Verse 6, it says in verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness this is the portion he wants us to concentrate on and in verse 7 he tells us and to godliness brotherly kindness that you are, you are very thoughtful you are very considerate you see your brother and you see you know what will hurt him that will not do why because you are pursuing brotherly kindness and what will discourage him what will stop him him on his journey to heaven you set all that aside you don't want to please yourself at the expense of your brother at the expense of your sister to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity in verse 8 it says for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ then in verse 9 it tells us in verse 9 and it says about he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins verse 10 it says wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure that's what you should pursue this new year. And that's the covenant the Lord is making with us this new year that you give necessary diligence that you will make your calling and election sure. For if ye do this thing, ye shall never fall. I pray you will not fall. And then in verse 11, it says, For so an interest shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And has raised us up together. Look at our portion. Look at our privilege. Look at our position. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has made us saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, having the nature of Christ. He makes us to sit together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. First John chapter 4 verse 4. In first John chapter 4, reading from verse 4, look at our portion. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you. That's our portion. Christ lives in us. The Father lives in us. The Holy Ghost lives in us. And the Holy Ghost, the Father, the Son, all the, the Trinity living in us empowers us and lifts us up and is giving us the gift. And now we can live and walk according to the leading of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Here yeah, I've got little children and I've overcome them. It's an overcoming life that God is calling us to in the new year. It is a life that overcomes, overcomes temptation, overcomes all things that 
are militating against us or militated against us in time past. It says we have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 17. In verse 17 herein is our love made perfect. Herein. Is our love made perfect? When you were saved, of course you loved God, but the love was not perfect. You loved the brethren, but the love was not perfect. And that's when we come to God again and we say, we want a greater portion of that love of God in our heart. And it says now, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world that's the portion we want to have we want to have the very life of christ we want to have the very love of christ we want to have the very image of christ within us that as he is so are we in this world colossians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 1 Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God then in verse 2 it says set your affection on things above that's a portion we shall love the things above more than the things on the earth who says that? The Lord, the Holy Spirit. It says, we shall seek those things which are above, not things on the earth. Verse 3, it says in verse 3, for ye are dead, you are dead to the world, you are dead to the things of the world, you are dead to all the silver and gold and all the trinkets of the world, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And then in verse 4 it says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Look at John chapter 14 verse 17. John 14 verse 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Look at this. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you shall be in you that's a portion that's what we have it tells us in uh, that same john 14 23 in verse 23 jesus answered and said unto him look at this if a man love me he will keep my words look at this now and my father will love him and we, Christ and the Father, already in verse 17, it says the Holy Spirit is with you and shall be in you. Here it says we, the Son and the Father, will come unto him and make our abode with him. Father, living in you, I will walk in them. I will move in them, and they shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord, the Father in you, Christ in you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him, the Father, the Son in you. That's a great portion. And then the Holy Ghost in us, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit in us. And they will, they will guide us and lead us and control us and direct us and empower us and envelope us and show us the way we ought to go. I pray it will happen to everyone. John chapter 17, reading from verse 20. John chapter 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these disciples here alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. 
verse 21 that they all may be one that's the real blessing we're one with the father one with christ one with the holy spirit one with heaven one with his word it says that they all may be one and then we're one with each other as thou art in me and i in them that's a portion have you got that have you received that i in them that christ the light of the world will be in us that christ the master of the ocean and sea will be in us that christ the purifier the sanctifier will be in us that christ the healer christ the deliverer christ the redeemer will be in us that christ and christ alone will rule and reign in our hearts i in them that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me look at verse 22 in verse 22 on the glory which thou gavest me i have given them the glory that christ received from the father he also gave us that the glory which thou gavest me i've given them that they may be one even as we are one can you say that that you are one with the believers one with the body of christ one with the children of god as christ and the father are one if we are not one and our hearts are scattered here and there and all we're looking for healing that's only for the body all we're looking for is food that's only for the body all we're looking for we're looking for clothes that's only for the body all we're looking for is certificate certificate that's only for work and the work is for money and the money is for the body all that we're looking for everything appears to be centered on the body but our spirit our soul our mind and our destiny our eternity we're seeking for god the savior the sanctifier and the baptizer the king and the lord of our lives we're wanting more than any other thing it says and the glory which thou was giving me Give I give us me that I gave unto them that they may be one, even as we are one. Verse 23. In verse 23, I in them, and thou in me, thou in me, that's the Father in Christ, and I Christ in them. That means our portion on earth is that we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Word. If my if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be given unto you. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the, that the world may know, look at this, that thou hast sent me. Look at this now, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Do you ever think about that? That thou has loved them as thou has loved me. When you understand that the word abides in you, that the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost abides in you, and that the love that he had for his only begotten Son, that same love he has for you, you'll be victorious every time. And this year, victory. This year, power. This year, purity. And this year, you have the passion of the Lord in your heart, walking with you and living, abiding in you. In Jesus' name, verse 24. In verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Look at our portion. We have him in fullness here on earth. And then we go to heaven. And where he is, that's where we'll be. That they may behold my glory. What portion we have? It says, which thou hast given me. For thou loved me before the foundation of the world. Verse 25. In verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. 
And these have known that thou hast sent me. Verse 26. In verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me that the love wherewith thou hast loved me the same love you have earned for me from all eternity and i feel it every time and i know it every time and i ride on it every time i live by it every time the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them may be that same kind of love may be in them and i in them i christ in his fullness christ in all his provision that christ may be in us and i pray that today every promise we have seen and heard will be in you Every provision that was seen that Christ has made will be in you. And the love of the Father, where we the love of this only begotten Son, according to what Jesus himself has prayed and demanded, that that love will be in you. Amen. amen. In your life, amen. amen. This year, amen. amen. But this year will be different from the rest of the years. Yeah. All the hurry, hurry, hurry of the previous year will not be in this year. Yeah. All the control, run, 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 rush, 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 finish, finish. All that of the past year will not be in your, year, in your life this year, Jesus. Yeah. A new passion for the Lord, a new desire for the Lord, a new possession in the Lord, and a new faithfulness in the Lord. The Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. Are you ready to tarry before the Lord? Are you ready to wait before the Lord? Are you ready to send your SOS? and your desire are you ready to send it to the lord and to say lord here am i today no hurry no rushing we're waiting we're tarrying and the lord is going to hear our prayers in jesus name amen where are you where are you stand up and say lord here am i remember all those acts of the past hurry 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 throw it away will not be there today in your life rise up now and open your mouth before the lord and everything that you have learned everything you have heard all the promises that the lord himself has uh, related to us you are asking the lord now oh lord here am i i'm ready to pray i'm ready to tarry i'm ready to wait on the lord open your mouth and the lord will answer your prayer My brethren, it's time.